people are always talking about visions and missions and all of this mm-hmm. stuff. Um, and um, when people ask me, like, what example should I look to? Like, what company should I? I'm like, here's an organization <laughs> with a vision, a cause. It was founded with a, a cause. Um, it's an entrepreneurial venture. Mm-hmm. It's, it, America is an experiment. It's an entrepreneurial venture where a, a bunch of people got together and decided we needed to start our own country. Um, um, because there were certain obstacles that were getting in the way of a vision that we had of a better kind of country, but a kind of company, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they stated it right out of the beginning. All men are created equal, mm-hmm. endowed with these unalienable rights, amongst, amongst which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's not, a, uh, it's not just um, a competitive statement. Like, to be the best, to be the most respected, that's not what it was. And I'm amazed how many companies start their visions or missions right. with those that terribly egocentric language. Right. It was an ideal. And the amazing thing is, is we've been good at it and bad at it in our history, mm-hmm. but it's endured for 240 plus years because we fundamentally believe that we are at our best when we're pursuing that. But it is an ideal. Mm-hmm. We will never actually achieve all people are equal, but we will die trying. And that's the point. Mm-hmm. And it's the same for a company, which is true vision inside a company is something that has nothing to do with your product. It is an ideal to which you will attempt to build and advance that ideal through your company with your product. You'll never achieve the ideal, but you'll die trying. And this is what gives our work meaning. Mm. This is what gives our lives purpose, Mm. right? The difference between vision and a goal is the finish line. A goal is 26.2 miles. You can simply count the metrics and know when you've completed your goal. Is a vision is having a crystal clear sense of what the finish line looks like, but no idea of how far away it is. Wow. And, it's, and the reality is you will spend your entire life never actually crossing the finish line, but the joy that every marathon you complete, you feel like you're getting closer. Every milestone that you accomplish makes you feel like you're getting closer and closer to the ideal, and this is what gives our life and our work meaning. I'm at my best when I'm around people who believe what I believe. I know it seems silly, but... Um, I try very, very hard to sort of stack the deck, you know, to put myself in a position of strength. Um, So for example, you know, somebody asked me just yesterday, have you ever had sort of a bad, you know, engagement? And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, not really, but it's not because I'm some sort of sort of genius or anything, anything like that. It's because I stack the deck. It's because I want to be there. I want to be around people who want me there. In other words, if I'm somebody's 10th choice and like, you know, I'll probably turn it down. Um, Whereas if I'm their first choice, they really want me there, and so I'm, I'm more likely to have a good engagement. They're supportive of me, I'm supportive of them, and so, um, yeah, I'm at my best when I, when I stack the deck, when I choose to be in an environment where, where my strengths are, are there. I think success is, is, um, is seeing those around you work to their natural best and creating momentum for a vision, towards a vision that will last beyond yourself. So a guy is driving a bus for 20 years, mm-hmm. got to retire, He's on Madison Avenue in New York, packed every day as people getting on that bus and getting off. Mm -hmm. He has two kids, a wife, lives Mm -hmm. in Queens. Mm -hmm. He might call himself successful. Mm -hmm. Another guy might be vice president of that company who would call himself unsuccessful. So is success what you make of it? Success is a feeling. It's not, a, it's not a series of check marks and goals. I think people define success as, as finish lines, you know? They, I, well, I ran a marathon, I'm successful. The question is, A, why did you run the marathon, and what happens after you've completed the marathon? Do you just keep running marathons? What happens if you break your leg and you can no longer run marathons? You know, we set, a lot of people set um, financial goals. I'm successful when I make my first million. Ah, okay, now I have to make my second million. It's, success is a feeling, and, and it's the feeling of contribution. So your bus driver in Queens, if he has decided that his job as a bus driver is to ensure that everyone who gets on his bus feels better about themselves because they got on his bus and not another bus. And so he greets them with a smile, he says good morning, he says goodbye, that people will remember that, 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 uh, that ride that they took with him versus the, this vice president of the company who's made it about himself and his financial goals, he's the one who's unhappy, as opposed to seeing those around him succeed and those around him go home with a love of their, their day, you know, because they come to work in his company every day. So I, I, I still believe success and, and good leadership are, are about service to others. Passion is not an actionable word. It's correct, you know, that those who do the things that they're passionate about do better, but 
It's not helpful advice. Um, and so the question is, where does passion come from? Um, passion is a result. Passion is an energy. Um, passion is the feeling you have when you're engaged in something that you love. Passion is the feeling you have that um, you would probably do this for free, you know, and you can't believe somebody pays you to do it, you know. Um, and I think we mistake that passion is something we do in our private lives, but it shouldn't be done you know, in our careers, for example. And I'm a firm believer that you are who you are. And anybody who says, I'm different at home than I am at work, in one of those two places, you're lying. And the goal is to make everything you do in home and at work something that you have excitement to do. So how do you find the things that you're excited to do? Well, it's actually easier than you think. What are the things that you love to do? What are the things <laughs> that you would do for free? You know, how can you recreate that feeling and, and be paid for it. So what are the things that I do on the weekend, right? I love, um, I'm very involved in the art world. I love to go to museums and galleries, but I love to go see uh, dance and performances because I want to see how others are, are interpreting the world. So that inspires me. New ideas, new thoughts, new ways of looking at the world are, are things that interest me privately, and I seek it out and pay money for it, right? So does that mean I have to have a career in the arts? No, it means I have to have a career where new ideas are explored, where people are experimenting and trying things out, and I have to explore new ideas and try things out, and I'm just as excited to go to work every day as I am to you know, go do something on a Saturday night. Um, and so the idea of finding your passion is ironically simple because you should be doing stuff that you enjoy sometimes. What is the stuff that you enjoy, and then what is the stuff that you love? Who are the people that you love, and what, are those, what do they all have in common? Let me tell you a story. So a friend of mine and I, we went for a run in Central Park. Uh, the Roadrunners organization, uh, on the weekends, they host races. And it's very common at the end of the race, they'll have a sponsor who will give away something, apples or bagels or something. And on the, this particular day, when we got to the end of the run, there were some free bagels. And they had picnic tables set up. And on one side was a group of volunteers on the table were boxes of bagels, and on the other side was a long line of runners waiting to get their free bagel. So I said to my friend, let's, let's get a bagel. And he looked at me and said, ah, that line's too long. And I said, free bagel. And he said, I don't want to wait in line. And I was like, free bagel. And he says, nah, let's, it's too long. And that's when I realized that there's two ways to see the world. Some people see the thing that they want, and some people see the thing that prevents them from getting the thing that they want. I could only see the bagels. He could only see the line. And so I walked up to the line. I leaned in between two people, put my hand in the box, and pulled out two bagels. And no one got mad at me. Because the rule is, you can go after whatever you want. You just cannot deny anyone else to go after whatever they want. Now, I had to sacrifice choice. I didn't get to choose which bagel I got. I got whatever I pulled out. But I didn't have to wait in line. So the point is, is you don't have to wait in line. You don't have to do it the way everybody else has done it. You can do it your way. You can break the rules. You just can't get in the way of somebody else getting what they want. That's rule number one. Talk to so many smart, fantastic, ambitious, idealistic, hard-working kids, and they're right out of college, they're in their entry-level jobs, and I'll ask them, how's it going? And they'll say, I think I'm going to quit. And I'm like, why? And they say to me, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you know you've been here eight months, right? <laughs> they treat the sense of fulfillment, or even love, like it's a scavenger hunt like it's something you look for. My millennial friends, they've gone through so many jobs, they're either getting fired, I mean it was mutual, <laughs> or they're quitting because they're not making an impact or they're not finding the thing they're looking for, they're not feeling fulfilled, as if it's a scavenger hunt. Love, a job you find joy from, is not something you discover. It's not like, I found love, here it is. I found a job I love. That's not how it works. Both of those things require hard work. You are in love because you work very hard every single day of your life to stay in love. 
You find a job that brings you ultimate joy because you work hard every single day to serve those around you and you maintain that joy. It's not a discovery. But the problem is the sense of impatience. It's as if an entire generation is standing at the foot of a mountain. They know exactly what they want. They can see the summit. What they can't see is the mountain. This large, immovable object. That doesn't mean you have to do your time. That's not what I'm talking about. Take a helicopter, climb, I don't care. But there's still a mountain. Life, career fulfillment, relationships are journeys. The problem is, this entire generation has an institutionalized sense of impatience. And do they have the patience to go on the journey to maintain love, to feel fulfilled? Or do they just quit and on to the next? Dump and on to the next? Ghost and on to the next? The pressure, whether it's me or anybody else, is the same. You know, I have the same pressures as anyone else. There's time, there's performance, there's financial. I mean, there are, you know, there's deadlines. My pressures are not unique. Um, the situations may be different or, you know, but, but everybody has the same kinds of pressures. Um, but what I found, or what I find fascinating, is the interpretation of the stimuli. If, if, let, me, let me explain. So I was watching the Olympics, this last summer Olympics, and I was amazed at how bad the questions were that the reporters would ask all the athletes. And almost always, they asked the same question, whether they were about to uh, compete or after they competed. Were you nervous, right? And to a T, all the athletes went, no, right? <laughs> and what I realized is it's not that they're not nervous, it's their interpretation of what's happening in their bodies. I mean, what, what happens when you're nervous, right? Your heart rate starts to go, you're, you know, you sort of get a little tense, you get a little sweaty, right? You, you have expectation of what's coming, and we interpret that as, I'm nervous. Now, what's the interpretation of excited? Your heart rate starts to go, you become, you're anticipating what's coming, right? You get a little sort of like tense. It's all the same thing. It's the same stimuli. Except these athletes, these, these Olympic quality athletes, have learned to interpret the stimuli that the rest of us would say is nervous as excited. They all say the same thing. No, I'm not nervous. I'm excited. And so I've actually practiced it just to tell myself when I start to get nervous that this is excitement, yeah. you know? And so where, when you, I used to speak in front of a large audience and somebody would say, how do you feel? I used to say, a little nervous. Now when somebody says, how do you feel? I'm like, really excited actually. <laughs> and it, it came from just sort of telling myself, no, 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 this is excitement. And it becomes a little bit automatic later on. Um, but it's kind of a remarkable thing to deal with pressure by interpreting what your body is experiencing as excitement rather than nerves. Um, and it's really kind of effective. It makes you want to rush forwards rather than pull back, and yet it's the same experience. In the 18th century, there was something that spread across Europe and eventually made its way to America called puerperal fever, also known as the Black Death of Childbed. Basically what was happening is women were giving birth and they would die within 48 hours after giving birth. This black death of childbirth was the ravage of Europe and it got worse and worse and worse over the course of over a century. In some hospitals, it was as high as 70% of women who gave birth who would die as a result of giving birth. But this was the Renaissance. This was the time of empirical data and science, and we had thrown away things like tradition and mysticism. These were men of science, these were doctors. And these doctors and men of science wanted to study and try and find the reason for this black death of childbed, and so they got to work studying, and they would study the corpses uh, of, the, of the women who had died. And in the morning they would conduct autopsies, and then in the afternoon, they would go and deliver babies and finish their rounds. And it wasn't until somewhere in the mid-1800s that Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, father of Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, realized that all of these doctors who were conducting autopsies in the morning weren't washing their hands before they delivered babies in the afternoon. And he pointed it out and said, guys, you're the problem. And they ignored him and called him crazy for 30 years. Until finally somebody realized that if they simply washed their hands, it would go away. And that's exactly what happened. 
When they started sterilizing their instruments and washing their hands, the black death of childbed disappeared. My point is, the lesson here is, sometimes you're the problem. We've seen this happen all too recently with our new men of science and empirical uh, studiers and these men of finance who are smarter than the rest of us until the thing collapsed. And they blamed everything else except themselves. And my point is, is take accountability for your actions. You can take all the credit in the world for the things that you do right, as long as you also take responsibility for the things you do wrong. It must be a balanced equation. You don't get it one way and not the other. You get to take credit when you also take accountability. I spoke at an education summit for Microsoft. I also spoke at an education summit for Apple. At the, education for my, at the Education Summit for Microsoft, I would say that 70% of the executives spent about 70% of their presentations talking about how to beat Apple. At the Apple Education Summit, 100% of the executives spent 100% of their presentations talking about how to help teachers teach and how to help students learn. One is playing this way and one is playing that way. One is playing finite, and the other one is playing infinite. Guess which one gets frustrated? <laughs> so at the end of my talk at Microsoft, they gave me a gift. They gave me the new Zune when it was a thing. <laughs> and let me tell you, this thing was spectacular. It was the most elegant piece of technology I'd ever used. The user interface was incredible. The design was spectacular. I absolutely loved it. It was easy to use, and it was bright and gorgeous and fantastic. It didn't work on iTunes, which is a different problem, so I couldn't use it, but, but it was amazing. <laughs> and elegant. My god, it was elegant. So I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with a very senior Apple executive, sort of employee number 12 kind of guy. And, you know, I like to stir pots. So I turned to him, I said, you know, Microsoft gave me their new Zoom. And it is so much better than your iPod Touch. And he turned to me and he said, I have no doubt. Conversation over. Because the infinite player understands sometimes you're ahead and sometimes you're behind. Sometimes your product is better and sometimes it's worse. The goal isn't to be the best every day. The goal isn't to, out, to outdo your competition every day. That's a finite construction. If I had said to Microsoft, I've got the new iPod Touch and it's so much better than your Zoom, they would have said, can we see it? What does it do? React, 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 react. Finite players play to, be be to beat the people around them. Infinite players play to be better than themselves. To wake up every single day and say, how can we make our company a better version of itself today than it was yesterday? How can we create a product this week that's better than the product we created last week? We also have to play the infinite game. It's not about being ranked number one. It's not about having more followers on Twitter than your friends. It's not about outdoing anyone. It's about how to outdo yourself. It's not about selling more books or getting more TED views than somebody else. It's about how to make sure that the work that you're producing is better than the work you produced before. You are your competition. And that is what ensures you stay in the game the longest. And that is what ensures you find joy. Because the joy comes not from comparison, but from advancement. Every decision we make in our lives as individuals or as organizations is a piece of communication. It's our way of saying something about who we are and what we believe. This is why authenticity matters. This is why you have to say and do the things you actually believe. Because the things you say and do are symbols of who you are. And we look for those symbols so we can find people who believe what we believe. Our very survival depends on it. So if you're putting out false symbols, you will attract people to those symbols, but you won't be able to form trust with them. This is what Tiger Woods did to us. He lied. He lied. He told us what he thought we wanted to hear. And it was great, and we were drawn to it. And all of us who kind of liked that idea of the sort of the good guy, 
were drawn to it until we found out it was a lie. He could have been the bad boy of golf. He could have had all the same endorsements and had a fantastic career and still been hailed as one of the great athletes of our day, but he didn't. He chose to lie. Good luck forming trust again, Tiger. We don't believe you. We don't trust you. The goal of putting something out there, if you say what you believe and you do what you believe, you will attract people who believe what you believe. If you go to one of your friends and you say to one of your friends, how would you like me to dress so that you'll like me better? How would you want me to address you? How do you want me to speak so that you'll like me more? Right? Your friends are going to look at you and be like, what are you talking about? You're like, come on, come on, come on. What should I wear so that you'll find me more appealing? And how would you like me to speak to you so that you'll like me more? And your friends are going to tell you, just be yourself. That's why I like you. I don't just be yourself. Now think about what we do in industry. What do we do? We do market research and we go out and we ask the customers, what kind of things, the way we, what style should we speak to you? How should we decorate ourselves? What kind of things are you drawn to so that we can do those things so you'll like us more? It's just as ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous. Organizations should say and do the things they actually believe and they will attract people who believe what they believe. Or they can choose to lie and at the slightest hint that they might be lying, cynicism sets in. And people start saying, I'm not sure I can trust these guys because there's not a lot of consistency in all the things they say and do, which means they can't have a very strong belief set or they're lying to me. And we call them inauthentic. The entire process of asking other people who we should be is inauthentic. That's hilarious to me. All these positioning studies we do are inherent. We're going to do a study to find out from people so we can be more authentic. That's hilarious. <laughs> say and do what you actually believe and the symbols you put out there, the things you say and the things you do, those red hats are ways that people can find you. What you have the ability to do as designers is create those symbols and allow people to use those things to say something about who they are. Work for companies, work for clients, work for people who you believe what they believe. Show up and feel a part of something bigger than yourself. And your part is to put what they believe into pictures and words and symbols and graphics so that other people can use those things to say something about who they are. People put Harley Davidson logos on their body to say something about who they are. Corporate logo. Ain't no Procter and Gamble's tattooed on anybody's arm. <laughs> because Harley means something. They stand for something. People put that tattoo on there not to tell you that they own a motorcycle. They put that tattoo there to tell you something about themselves. You ever see anybody with a, with a Mac laptop put a sticker over that beautiful shining apple? Ain't never gonna happen. <laughs> then how will you know who I am? Do you ever see anybody with a PC break out the Windex to clean out their computer? Mac people? <sighs> Have you ever seen a dirty Mac? Doesn't exist. Does not exist. Why? Because it's who I am. These are symbols we use. The companies that are crystal clear in what they believe, and they're disciplined in how they do it, and they're consistent in what they do, and everything they say and everything they do serves as a symbol of the set of values and beliefs. We use those symbols to say something about who we are. We surround ourselves with the people and the products and the brands that say something about who we are. And when we can find the people who believe what we believe, we're weirdly drawn to them because our very survival depends on it. We need it. And so the more you can give of yourself, the more you can give of what you believe, the more you can discipline, with discipline, say and, and do the things you actually believe, strange things start to happen. Nelson Mandela is a particularly special case study in the leadership world because he is universally regarded as a great leader. You can take other personalities and depending on the nation you go to, we have different opinions about other personalities, but Nelson Mandela across the world is universally regarded as a great leader. He was actually the son of a tribal chief and he was asked one day, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he responded that he would go with his father to tribal meetings. And he remembers two things when his father would meet with other elders. One, they would always sit in a circle. And two, his father was always the last to speak. 
You will be told your whole life that you need to learn to listen. I would say that you need to learn to be the last to speak. I see it in boardrooms every day of the week. Even people who consider themselves good leaders, who may actually be decent leaders, will walk into a room and say, here's the problem, here's what I think, but I'm interested in your opinion, let's go around the room. It's too late. The skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. One, it gives everybody else the feeling that they have been heard. It gives everyone else the ability to feel that they have contributed. And two, you get the benefit of hearing what everybody else has to think before you render your opinion. The skill is really to keep your opinions to yourself. If you agree with somebody, don't nod yes. If you disagree with somebody, don't nod no. Simply sit there, take it all in, and the only thing you're allowed to do is ask questions so that you can understand what they mean and why they have the opinion that they have. You must understand from where they are speaking, why they have the opinion they have, not just what they are saying. And at the end, you will get your turn. It sounds easy, it's not. Practice being the last to speak. That's what Nelson Mandela did.